Now I'd like to turn the conference over to Attorney General Becerra. Please go ahead, sir. David, thank you very much, and good morning to everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, you heard, as David said, that we're here to discuss the DACA program, and I'm pleased to be joined by a fellow Attorney General from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and a good friend, Maura Healy. I want to say thank you to Attorney General Healy for joining us on this call. Also, we'll have a professor from San Diego State University, uh, Professor Tom Wong will be speaking to us. He's done quite a bit of work on the DACA issue, and he'll lay out some information that I think you'll find very interesting in terms of the steep cost of trying to undo the DACA program in places like California and Massachusetts. And then certainly, finally, I want to make sure that we hear from Christina Jimenez, who's the executive director of United Green Green, someone who has been on the ground, who lives this, has worked it, and has been doing the vital work that is important for our young uh, Americans who are trying to prove that they, too, can dream the American dream. So with that, uh, let me start by saying that well, we know 2017, it's been a, not just a challenging year, but Washington has taken some actions that are very troubling and harmful to families, not just in California or Massachusetts, but throughout the United States. Immigration enforcement orders and some actions that have been taken by the Trump administration have really been among the most alarming. Uh, this administration in Washington, D.C. seems to be targeting our family our neighbors, our friends. They're undermining public safety by forcing people further into the shadows. They're sending mixed messages about how they're going to enforce federal policies. And certainly they're causing tremendous fear among immigrant communities throughout the country. That's why Attorney General Healy and I filed a Freedom of Information Act request with the Department of Homeland Security just two weeks ago. We're hoping that we'll get, with the cooperation from the federal administration, are the records that describe uh, the Trump administration's policies with regard to enforcement of immigration laws, especially with regard to young immigrants granted deferred action for childhood arrivals at the DACA program. Uh, while some leaders in other states may not wish to stand with our young immigrant brothers and sisters, daughters and sons, we do. Uh, and let me be very clear, DACA is fully lawful as an initiative, and President Trump should maintain it. More than a quarter of the DACA grantees in this country live in this state of California. They're people who are working, they're contributing to our economy, they're buying their first car, their first home, they're getting college degrees, they're making our communities a better place to live. If DACA were to end, well, California businesses would lose more than a billion dollars in turnover costs. I think Professor Wong is going to get into this, but the, uh, there are costs associated with losing trained and qualified workers who have ambition and industry, and we're being forced now uh, to lose those jobs, lose those opportunities, and that entrepreneurship. And that, in turn, forces a lot of American businesses to rehire for those positions. And instead of scapegoating our kids, we should be ensuring that they can fulfill, fulfill their potential. And for many of us, we think that's what the American dream is all about. Uh, our young people, and I say this as the father of three daughters, our young people are our most precious natural, nat, uh, natural resource. And any policy that harms them, it harms us. That's why as the Attorney General for the state of California, and I know uh, Attorney General Healy would easily say the same thing, that we will do everything in our power as, attorney gen as attorneys general for our states uh, to defend DACA and the young people who make countless contributions to our state and our country. And with that, let me uh, now turn it over to my good friend and one of the powerful attorney generals of, this, of the state, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, Maura Healy. Maura. Uh, thank you very much, General Becerra, and thank you for your, your leadership and your advocacy on what is an incredibly important issue uh, across this country, certainly in the great state of California, but also here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I think the basic point is this. Uh, right now, at this time in this country, given the climate and given the fear and anxiety created and exacerbated continually uh, by the Trump administration, 
the last thing we need is another immigration problem. We don't need to create problems where there aren't problems. The fact of the matter is DACA is working. It's legal and it's the right policy. It's the right policy for public safety and for law enforcement. It's the right policy for our economy. Here in Massachusetts alone, we're talking about 23,000 young people who were brought here as kids, who were brought here as young children, who grew up here, who went to school here, who even served in the military and fought for our country. DACA, over the last five years, has allowed these young people to come out from the shadows. They're able to get uh, a job. They're able to go to college and get an education. They're able to contribute in meaningful ways to our communities. That's why DACA is important. Um, it's been tested. It's survived court challenges. And more importantly, from an on-the-ground perspective and as a matter of law enforcement, we know that DACA is working. It's why law enforcement, local leaders, and our business community want DACA to stay. We need DACA to remain in place until, of course, a more permanent solution is in place, and we desperately need federal immigration reform. But in the interim, DACA should stay. Unfortunately, a group of Republican AGs and the Trump administration seem to be more interested in scoring political points by targeting immigrants, specifically young people. I continue to hear from community leaders about the fear in our neighborhoods, people literally skipping doctor's appointments, pulling their kids out of school or not taking them to school, uh, even being fearful to report crimes or to cooperate with law enforcement because they are afraid. That's really bad for our communities. It's bad for the health and well-being of families. It's bad for public health, and it's bad for public safety. And that's why this is such a wrong-headed, uh, misdirected move by the Republican AGs and members of the Trump administration. Look, um, here are some steps that my office has taken uh, along with many of my colleagues. As General Becerra mentioned, on the same day that Texas AG Ken Paxson sent a letter uh, on this issue to the Trump administration, I led a coalition of, of 10 AGs uh, along with, with AG Becerra in demanding transparency from the Trump administration on this issue. The bottom line is that states and cities and local law enforcement need to have real information about federal immigration policies and exactly how the federal government is enforcing those policies, and specifically whether our uh, DACA registrants here in Massachusetts and in other states are already being detained or deported. We also put out guidance to our schools and to employers and health care centers in multiple languages, uh, making clear that schools have an obligation, a constitutional obligation to teach all students. Uh, that employers can't abuse their workers and threaten them with deportation. Um, and so we're working hard to combat some of the uh, unnecessary fear and anxiety that has been created. We can never forget that the immigrant story really is the American story, and that's what sets our country apart. Right now, uh, we need to be about affirming those American values and our commitment to ensuring that we always be a place that welcomes new people, new cultures, and new ideas to our states and to our shores. In Massachusetts, we've seen firsthand about the competitive advantage that immigrants and immigrant communities have provided to our state. Uh, I've heard from so many scientists, academics, artists, doctors, lawyers, uh, who've all come here and built a better life, not only for their families, but have enriched our communities, have enriched our, uh, our, our economy. And we need to continue to make progress and to move forward. And in the interim, we certainly need to stand up as, um, uh, as those of us responsible for enforcing the Constitution, enforcing civil rights laws, uh, protecting workers, protecting students, protecting uh, young people. We need to make sure that we are protecting uh, refugees and immigrants and, and making sure that their voices have, are heard. And, and that's work that we have done and will continue to do. Uh, again, it's an honor to stand with my great colleague, uh, General Becerra, uh, and advocate and speak to this important issue. And our demand to the Trump administration is that DACA remain in place. And the hope is that at some point, um, 
those in Washington will begin the serious and necessary work of federal immigration reform. But until then, let's not break what's working. With that, I'd like to turn the conference over to Tom Wong, who is an assistant professor of political science of the University of California, San Diego. Well, thank you. Um, I want to thank Attorney General Becerra and Healy for leading this important discussion. So this year marks the fifth anniversary of DACA. Today, DACA has provided temporary relief from deportation and work authorization to approximately 800,000 undocumented young people. And with the announcement of DACA, many, including myself, began studying the policy in order to better understand its impact. I've conducted three nationwide polls of DACA recipients, polling over 3,000 individuals in total. In studying DACA, it's increasingly clear that it not only positively affects the lives of undocumented young people and their families, but DACA is also having a positive impact on the American economy more broadly. In short, DACA has been an integration success story. So I'll discuss some of the results from my most recent October 2016 study of 1,308 DACA recipients. To start, let's talk about DACA's impact on employment. We see that 87% of DACA recipients are currently employed, with an additional 8% not working, but in school. This means that a full 95% of our respondents are currently employed or, or are in school. Among those who are working, 53% reported moving to a job with better pay after receiving DACA. 49% reported moving to a job that, quote, better fits their education and training post DACA. And 48% reported moving to a job with better working conditions. Importantly, we also found that 6% of DACA recipients have started their own businesses. These businesses include tech startups, online craft stores, and tax preparation services among many others. So next, let's talk about DACA's impact on earnings and the broader economy. We see that DACA's increasing hourly wages of DACA recipients by an average of 42%. It follows that 60% of our respondents reported that their increased earnings have, quote, helped them become financially independent. We also find evidence that DACA recipients are creating larger footprints in the American economy as consumers. For example, 54% reported purchasing their first car after receiving DACA, and now 12% have reported purchasing their first home. These findings make clear that DACA has helped unlock the economic potential of DACA recipients. So last, let's talk about DACA's impact on education. A full 92% of respondents said that because of DACA, quote, I pursued educational opportunities that I previously could not. Now, we see from the data that DACA recipients are poised to add to our college-educated and college-trained workforce as the major specializations and training that they're pursuing range from early childhood education, biochemistry, computer science, creative writing, graphic design, neuroscience, nursing, social work, among many other career paths. Now, before I end, I want to preview some of the preliminary findings from a new study on DACA that I'm currently working on. Now, the economic costs of ending DACA are not limited to the loss of the tax revenues that come from the higher wages that DACA recipients are earning or to the loss of the sales and property taxes that are generated for states and localities as DACA recipients expand their economic footprint. Indeed, as work authorization is one of the main pillars of DACA, and as a large majority of DACA recipients are in the workforce, an end to DACA would likely cause significant turnover costs to employers meaning the cost employers will spend on finding, hiring, and training qualified replacement workers. Nationally, ending DACA would cost employers an estimated $4.02 billion in turnover costs. In California alone, this figure is an estimated $1.17 billion. So now I'll turn it over to Christina Jimenez, the Executive Director at United We Train. Thank you, Professor Tom. Um, I'm the executive director and co-founder of United We Dream. Uh, we are the largest immigrant youth-led organization in the country. I myself grew up undocumented um, in New York City, um, and my brother Jonathan, who's 23 years old, is one of the 800,000 young people protected from deportation and has been able to work to go to community college because of the Deferred Action for Travel Arrivals program. Immigrant youth like us, to create the DACA program. 
And for the last five years, the DACA program has proven to be a lifeline for not just immigrant youth, but for our entire families and communities. My brother, for example, has been able to go to school and work part-time to help my parents who are undocumented. I want to thank Attorney General uh, Becerra and Haile from standing up for DACA and standing out with our families in this very critical moment. And I want to thank you, Professor Tom Wong, uh, a fellow dreamer, for your groundbreaking research on the lives of immigrant youth. And we're here in this call from United We Dream's perspective as a leading organization in winning this program and representing immigrant youth across the country to be very clear that, that the program is facing an existential threat today. In a cheap political attack, 10 far-right Republican politicians lashed out at immigrant youth, demanding that the DACA program be terminated by September 5th putting nearly a million immigrant young people onto the deportation pipeline. We read news reports that this may be the doing of extremists in the Trump administration designed to force their dangerous agenda into becoming a reality. The, the Texas Attorney General and nine other uh, politicians from Republican states sent this letter to the Trump administration about a week and a half ago threatening to end the program. And this threat is the ultimate bully move, and it is clearly shameful. The Trump administration has not pushed back on this Republican threat of this lawsuit on the DACA program. And in fact, the Trump administration has allowed DACA beneficiaries to be targeted for detention and deportation in recent months. For members of my community and for all people of conscience, I want to be very clear that the only way that we will beat these extremists in this administration, save DACA, and protect immigrant youth is to stand up, rise up to this moment, and organize to protect our community. Five years ago, that's exactly what we did. Immigrant youth and our allies organized for multiple, multiple years, share our stories courageously, risking deportation. And after a lot of work of organizing our communities, we won the DACA program. And we stopped the deportation of the nearly a million young people that have benefited from it. Each of these young people and their families have paid about $500 every two years in fees to pay for the program. As Professor Wan has said, in many of the research and surveys that we have collaborated um, on, we have seen the impact that the DACA program has had in our communities and also the country. 48% of them have gotten a better job. Many of them who have moved from working um, in the underground economy to uh, being able to seize their dreams and getting to work um, in universities, as teachers, and even as organizers across the country. 63% of them have gotten a better job. 90% of them have gotten driver's licenses. And like in the case of my brother, that has been a vital change that has allowed him to be able to give my parents a ride back to and from work. United We Dream works with immigrant youth all across the country. People like my brother, people like Angelica Villalobos, who is not only a DACA recipient, but also a, uh, a parent, a mother, um, to U.S. citizen children. We have people like my brother, who is a judo uh, teacher and a student. We have workers. We have LGBTQ um, people in our community, like Danny Vargas from Mississippi. And in a sea of bad political news that our community has been experiencing, DACA is some good news, not only for our community, but for the country. And while we have been building up our lives and helping our families out and continuing to advance a fight for the dignity and justice for immigrants, we have seen Republicans just intensify their attacks by introducing bills to kill the program 
And now with this recently um, legal challenge to the program. So days like today, and as we are organizing with our members across the country, I remember how hard immigrant youth and families together fought to win this program. And we are not stopping now because this is our home and we are here to stay. And today the DACA program still stands, but we are clear that it's vulnerable. And we're also clear that all of us, DACA beneficiaries or not in our communities, are committed to continuing to fight, to stand up to these attacks, and to organize our community, and to push back against the Department of Homeland Security, against the Attorney General, and against the attacks of this administration to terrorize our community, to criminalize our community, and to rob us from the opportunities of living without fear and with our families in this country that is our home. I again want to appreciate Attorney General Becerra, Attorney General Healy, for standing up with us today. You are the example for the rest of uh, elected officials across the country. And it is time for all policymakers, regardless of their party affiliation, regardless of their level of office, to stand up for immigrants, to stand up for what is right for our country, and to do everything that they can to protect DACA recipients and to protect our communities from deportation, and to encourage and to push for local and state policies that will protect our communities from the attacks of the Trump administration. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for holding this uh, interesting call. A um, uh, question for uh, the Attorney General. Uh, are you anticipating a litigation strategy? Uh, are you expecting that uh, Attorney General Paxton and uh, the other uh, Attorney, Attorney General aligned with Texas will uh, sue eventually uh, the Justice Department or DHS to force uh, them to shut down this program. How do you see the strategy playing out in terms of the courts? I can, uh, I can start, and certainly I, I want to turn to Attorney General Healy as well. Um, uh, we're prepared to do everything uh, we can uh, within the powers that I have as the Attorney General here in the state of California to defend the people of our state, including the Dreamers, who are here under the DACA program. Uh, in, in particular, we're prepared to uh, work with the Trump administration and uh, uh, support President Trump's uh, previous declarations that uh, the DACA program was one that he was not prepared to uh, rescind. And so we're prepared to work with uh, the Trump administration, support them, and defend that posture that uh, so far the president has taken. But we're prepared to do anything we can here in California to uh, defend the individuals in California who are under the DACA program. And let me turn it over to uh, Eileen. Oh, thank you so much, General Becerra. I think the bottom line is that everything is on the table in terms of the advocacy and the efforts that we need, we'll need to engage in, uh, depending on what they do. Again, the whole goal here is to ensure that the Trump administration maintains DACA, keeps it in place because it's something that is working and it is effective, um, and we need to keep it in place. Uh, you see from the letter authored by Ken Paxton from the state of Texas, it's sort of interesting to note Texas is home to nearly 250,000 DACA registrants, uh, DACA uh, qualifying young people. And I just have a very different view of what will best serve uh, young people like that, their families, and the broader economy. And that's why we're fighting so hard to sure that DACA stays in place. But we'll take this as it, as it comes. Again, our effort today is to show solidarity. Um, we're joined not only by the uh, individuals on this call, but also by leaders in uh, in business and in local governments and others in law enforcement who really are, are committed in solidarity 
a, for a program that's that's working. So we'll have to see what, what actions are taken by the Trump administration, but it is certainly our hope that this program remains in place. David, next question. Our next question comes from the line of Julio Ricardo Varela with National Public Radio, Latino USA. Uh, good, good afternoon. Um, I just actually have two questions. One, just to follow up on what, what you're saying, uh, both for the attorney generals, by basically what you're saying is that you're going to do anything. What specifically does that mean? Does that mean um, are you waiting for the Trump administration to act? Are you, wait, like, are you taking preemptive measures or anything? Like, what, what specific strategies do you have in mind? And then I have a follow-up about um, whether – any La there's there's been prominent Latinos in the Trump administration who've said that they're saved DACA, and that it's going to be used as a bargaining chip for future immigration reform. Uh, that it would be bipartisan between Democrats and Republicans. So I'd like to hear your thoughts about that as well. Whether that's even like a, a realistic in in your eyes. General Hilly, let me go. Let you go ahead and start. Sure. Well, thank you. Um, I think very important, Julio, is to get actual information and, and, and transparency from the Trump administration about exactly what is happening and what has happened. One of the reasons, and really the reason, we sent the FOIA request uh, that many of us joined together in sending a request to the federal government and various federal agencies is because, as you know, there have been many reports out there about uh, uh, DACA registrants being either arrested subject to deportation or detention while uh, inquiries are proceeding. And I think as a practical matter, one of the things we need right now is far more clarity, transparency from the Trump administration about exactly how they are implementing federal immigration policy. That is the basis for our public records request, which we sent on June 29th. So we are awaiting that information, and uh, that is very important. Second, I think we do uh, have experience as states litigating in the court. This is an issue that uh, originally was litigated. There was an initial challenge brought to DACA um, years ago by some states, and um, we'll have to see what happens. That, that challenge was unsuccessful, but um, we'll have to see what, what happens, and certainly we'll be prepared to act as states um, in court uh, standing up for the law, the rule of law, and and people's rights. I'll just, uh, I agree with uh, what the General just said, and so I'll just answer the second part, Julio, of your question. Uh, in terms of any potential uh, immigration uh, legislation and using this as a bargaining chip, uh, uh, we're talking about children, young young men and women, uh, I don't believe that uh, it's a good practice for Congress to pe hold people hostage to try to get uh, other aspects of policy uh, implemented. And uh, I certainly hope that what drives Congress on doing any type of reform is, uh, is what is best for this country. And I don't believe there's any doubt. And you heard Professor Wong mention some of the numbers and the data and the facts. Uh, I don't think anyone can challenge the fact that DACA has been good for this country, not just for the uh, dreamers who uh, have applied, not just for the families, but it's been good for our country and our economy. And so if uh, policy is driven by what's good for our country and our economy and our families, then we'll not only have DACA, but we'll have comprehensive immigration reform. Not that we're going to play a game of ransom and hostage-taking uh, with young men and women who are hoping to be able to dream. David, next question. Our next question comes from one of Pilar Marrero with Law Opinion. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, so following up on the legal, I know the previous challenges to DACA way when, back when DACA was initiated had to do with uh, it did not resolve the merits. Uh, of the case, according to what some attorneys have told me. Um, and what the attorneys general apparently want to do is to bring that back to Judge Hannon in Texas, the same judge that got rid of DAPA and extended DACA. Um, do you think they could potentially have a, a, a way to get rid of DACA five years after it started? I mean, legally, do they have a... Do they have a pathway to really um, do what they did with DAPA? 
Uh, General Healy, is that okay if I start? Sure. So uh, let's remember, it's very important to remember that um, the challenge that started in Texas was not a challenge of the DACA program. It was a challenge of the DAPA program, which dealt with the parents of children who had status to be in the country. Um, we also did not get a final uh, resolution in the courts uh, when the Supreme Court, by a four to four uh, vote, did not uh, answer conclusively where to go. And so, uh, Ilar, the, the, the truth is that I think many of us believe that the underpinnings of DACA are strong, that the uh, history of DACA is proof of its success, and that, quite honestly, the program itself has the support of the American people. And so I believe we have every reason to be confident that uh, if someone, whether in Texas or in some other state, were to try to challenge the DACA program and the president's ability to move forward with DACA, I, I we feel very confident. I feel very confident that uh, we will succeed in, in any effort to undermine DACA. But again, it's the, the question is is still open, and we would hope that, as uh, General Healy has said, that we can get some clarity from the administration on where it stands firmly on DACA, because it's very important to help it continue to be successful. Uh, to have a clear sense of where the administration is. And we're, we're prepared, as we said, to do everything possible to defend it. Mm -hmm. This is Christina um, from United We Dream. You know, uh, the only thing that I would add and appreciate your question um, is that though using legal tactics, uh, we know that the attack um, is very clear. Right? It's extremists in the Trump administration that want to get rid of the program um, and that have used similar strategies uh, to attack our communities, like in the case of DAPA and DACA+. Plus. Um, but I will say that this is less about the legality of DACA. And the legality of DACA has been established. What we are talking about is the politics of standing with common sense and decency and immigrant families. Um, versus the uh, extreme attacks from the Trump administration. Um, so I, from our perspective, um, you know, we believe that the legality of the program has been established, uh, but this is rather a political fight. Um, and as I mentioned in my remarks, um, we are ready to organize our community um, and to organize across the country with uh, policymakers and allies um, to ensure that in this political fight, what is made clear is that DACA is a popular program. It has benefited immigrants. It has benefited the country. It is common sense, and it needs to remain in place. And so, Lara, I, I, just to re reflect for a moment on the fact that, that that challenge was filed years ago. We now have the benefit of actually seeing DACA in action. Remember, at the time, there was the challenge to uh, DACA as it is today, and and not only um, did you see members of immigrant rights organizations come forward and support DACA, but so many faith leaders, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops joining with <clears throat> so many other faith groups standing up for DACA. You saw city and county officials who understood that DACA was actually going to improve tax rolls and that there's a benefit when immigrants are able to work um, authorized and earn higher wages. You saw the members of the business community come forward and support because they know that there is a public interest and the economy is served by creating a state workforce uh, and a stable workforce and, and making uh, the government's immigration enforcement priorities more transparent. So I think that what, what we would see at this juncture uh, is that now with DACA in practice, uh, looking at the statistics, whether statistics around the significant increase in wages for DACA recipients, uh, if you look at the fact that 92% of those DACA recipients in schools um, have pursued educational opportunities that they couldn't have previously pursued, there is going to be uh, overwhelming evidence that DACA not only 
um, is legally sound, but that it's justified and it's absolutely in the direction of where we need to go in our states, um, but uh, all across this, this country. I think we have time for one, maybe two questions, and so let's see if we can handle that. Okay, uh, we have a question from the line of Dan Levine with Reuters. Please go ahead. Hi there, thanks for doing the call. Um, I was curious, you know, as the, the Paxton letter, I think, set out a date in September um, of when they would file claims over DACA, and so as the administration, as the Trump administration is weighing what it wants to do during this period, and in the aftermath of your FOIA um, suit from a couple weeks ago, I'm just curious, has there been any communication whatsoever, whatsoever between either of your offices and the administration on these issues? Um, have they reached out at all uh, in, after the FOIA suit to, to potentially try to resolve it, or has it just been complete radio silence? I, I will quickly say and then turn it over to Attorney General uh, Healy that uh, we continue to try to reach out to the administration on this. We may have submitted the FOIA request, obviously, because we haven't gotten clarity, but we'll continue to reach out to them uh, and, and try to work in partnership with them on some of these programs because it's important for everybody that we try to make sure that federal and state governments are working together. The, we have received confirmation from some of the recipients to whom we sent the, the FOIA request that they have received the request, and now it's simply a matter of awaiting the production of information, um, and we will push for that, uh, including using legal recourse uh, should we need to if they're not forthcoming. But uh, that's the first order of, of business here with this, um, and then we'll have to wait to see what um, happens um, and what decisions the Trump administration makes. David, one final question. I want to be respectful of uh, my fellow speakers and all those who have joined the call. Uh, we'll take one last question. And it appears we have no further questions at this time. Great. Well, we want to say thank you to Attorney General Healy, to Professor Wong, and to uh, Christina Jimenez for having been part of this phone call. Uh, we want to thank all those who participated by joining in as well. Uh, we will keep you apprised of uh, any progress, and we will continue to defend the program because we know it is good for America. So we want to say thank you to everyone who participated in this teleconference call.